Hello everyone, welcome to Dental School where learning is simplified. Today we will be discussing an important topic from a third year BDS subject, General Surgery and the topic is Tetanus. This is asked as a long essay question and also sometimes as a short note. So try to learn the topic along with me as you watch the video. So let's get started. Now tetanus is a very serious disorder because it has a very high rate of morbidity and a very high rate of mortality even with treatment. So who is the culprit or who is the causative organism behind this deadly disease? It is the Clostridium tetany. Okay? And I think it's quite easy for you to remember the name because it is tetany, Clostridium tetany and the disease is tetanus. right? So you can remember it easily. Now the specific characteristics of this organism is that it is anaerobic, gram-positive, spore-forming bacillus. Okay? And it has a characteristic drumstick-like appearance. This is very important because it's a specific characteristic feature of the Clostridium tetany. It has a drumstick-like appearance. I think you can appreciate that in the picture given below. Okay? Now usually it's quite difficult for us to remember whether an organism is gram-positive or gram-negative. But in the case of Clostridium tetany, it's quite easy to remember that. Because it's tetany or tetanus, right? So it starts with the alphabet T. So the way we write small letter T and the plus sign or the positive sign, they are somewhat similar. So you can remember that Clostridium tetany is a gram-positive organism. So let's move on. Now let's see what are the roots of infection. How is this Clostridium tetany gaining entry into your body? So the first one is umbilical cord. Umbilical cord infections are seen in neonates. But again it's not very common these days. But in the earlier days there was this ritual of application of cow dung in the umbilical cord of the infants. So back then there was an increased incidence of tetanus. Okay. The second one is through wounds. Wounds means it can be from your major uh, RTAs like your road traffic accidents or it can be through minor injuries with rusted nails, piercing ear lobes, tattooing, injection etc. Or it can be through septic abortions, surgical operations on your GI, on your gastrointestinal system or it can be even OT acquired that is operation theatre acquired if your sterilization techniques are not proper. So these are the six common routes of infection. Now I can almost say that tetanus is a wound infection, right? Tetanus is a wound infection. And I can say that if there is no wound, then there is no tetanus. Wound is that important prerequisite for tetanus to happen. Now let's see what are some of the favorable conditions for development of tetanus. And for you to remember that, we have a mnemonic, India, okay, I-N-D-I-A, India. I stands for injury, I told you how important that is, right? N stands for no immunization, if you have not been previously immunized. D stands for devitalized tissue. I stands for improper sterilization. And A stands for anaerobic conditions. And the sixth one is foreign body, you can just remember that. So these are the favorable conditions for the development of tetanus. Now let's move on to the toxins. Now it is actually not the organisms themselves that are causing the disease, but it is actually the toxins that are produced by them. Okay? Now what are these toxins produced by them? They are called as exotoxins. Exotoxins. And there are mainly two types of exotoxins that are released by this organism. One is tetanospasmin. And the other is tetanolysin. Tetanospasmin is a neurotoxin whereas tetanolysin is a hemolysin. Now among these two, it is this tetanospasmin which is the most important or the more dangerous guy. Why? Because he inhibits the release of cholinesterases. Tetanospasmin or that neurotoxin inhibits the release of cholinesterases. So what happens when cholinesterases are not being released? Automatically your acetylcholine level will go up or your acetylcholine will get accumulated. And what happens when your acetylcholine level gets accumulated? 
the tonic rigidity of the muscles will increase the muscles will keep contracting but they will not come back to your relaxed state and that is a very characteristic feature of tetanus now the problem with this is once fixed to the nervous tissue they are so adamant you cannot neutralize them but however the circulating toxins can be neutralized okay so this is the importance of toxins in tetanus now moving on to the period of onset now what is period of onset or why is period of onset so important while we are discussing tetanus period of onset is actually the time gap between the first onset of symptoms until the patient develops reflex spasm okay so what is period of onset it is the time period between the initial symptoms that is the initial symptoms are dysphagia and lockjaw so the time period between the patient developing dysphagia and lockjaw to the time the patient is developing reflex spasm that time period is what is called as period of onset now why is period of onset important because period of onset will help you to determine the prognosis of the disease okay that is if i say the period of onset is less than 48 hours then that means the prognosis of the patient is poor why because the time period that is taken for the patient to develop the reflex spasm or his condition is getting worse in a very short span of time that is in less than 48 hours itself his condition is getting worse which means the prognosis is poor but if it is greater than 48 hours it means it's better his conditions are not getting worse that fast so that means we have time to treat the patient so we can say the prognosis is better now moving on to the types of infection or the types of tetanus we have basically eight types of tetanus one is tetanus neonatorum tetanus neonatorum is mainly seen in the neonates and it's also called as the eighth day disease because it's usually seen developing between the sixth and the eighth day after birth and it has almost 100% mortality then we have local tetanus cephalic tetanus in cephalic tetanus the third cranial nerve and the seventh cranial nerve that is the oculomotor nerve and the seventh is the facial nerve they are being affected in cephalic tetanus then we have the bulba tetanus latent tetanus purpural tetanus post operative tetanus which is actually 100% fatal and we have otitis tetanus now let's move on to the clinical features now clinical features the first two are again trismus or lockjaw and dysphagia the initial symptoms that we just studied before then you have the general symptoms like sweating headache sleeplessness generalized convulsions fever tachycardia neck rigidity and rigidity of back muscles which is very important in tetanus and then there's something that is called as rhesus sardonicus rhesus sardonicus i'll explain to you that with the help of a picture so you'll understand it better now these are the common signs and symptoms that we just discussed there is fever high blood pressure muscle spasm difficulty in swallowing that is dysphagia then there is sweating lockjaw okay lockjaw and dysphagia were the initial symptoms and uh, for you to remember lockjaw i think you can remember this picture okay lockjaw is a very important feature in tetanus now this is rhesus sardonicus that i told you rhesus sardonicus means it is a spasm of the facial muscles and you will feel like the patient is grinning constantly okay that grin expression is always there on the face now let's move on to some different postures in tetanus okay now there are four different postures in tetanus which is again a very characteristic feature of tetanus they are opisthotonus orthotonus emprostotonus and pleurostotonus the names might look very complicated but it's actually very very simple to remember them i'll show you the pictures of each of them let's start with opisthotonus so in opisthotonus what is happening is the back muscles or the posterior muscles of the patient is acting more and as a result of which the back is arched 
okay he is bending backwards that is because his posterior muscles are acting more so now how do you remember that the starting letter of opisthotonus is o right so just see how we write o we write it like this right and then you complete the lower half so this looks like a patient arching backwards right so with that you can remember the back muscles are acting more and the patient is arching backwards now the second one is orthotonus orthotonus we all know ortho means straight right so that means both the front and back muscles are acting equally because of which the patient is lying straight the third one is m prosthotonus m prosthotonus actually is when your front muscles are acting more so the patient is actually bending forwards okay it is actually just the opposite of opisthotonus where the patient was bending backwards in m prosthotonus the patient is bending forwards because his front muscles are acting more and how do you remember that again the starting letter is e right so how do we write e we can write it like this okay so if you imagine this as the head and the foot of a patient see it's like as if he is bending forward right so you can remember m prosthotonus like that and the last posture is pleurosthotonus and in pleurosthotonus you can remember this l is for lateral bending that means the side muscles are acting more and therefore the patient is bending laterally so with that we cover the four important postures now coming to the treatment part of it very important part again so we have split the treatment into two topics mainly or two headings one is general management and the other is specific management and specific management we have again subdivided to mild cases seriously ill cases and dangerously ill cases so first let's go to the general management the general management the first step is to admit and isolate the patient now when i say isolate the patient it is not because uh, tetanus is a contagious disease or because it spreads but it is just so that we avoid any kind of even minor stimuli that can actually precipitate a spasm in the patient that is the reason why we isolate the patient then the second one is give a pro proper wound care okay that is you clean the wound you disinfect the wound you drain any pus or take out the foreign bodies and give a proper dressing then you what you have to do is give injection tt that is tetanus toxoid we all know tt injections right so that is tetanus toxoid 0.5 ml as im intramuscularly okay then the two important anti tetanus serum that you have to remember is the first one is ats or anti tetanus serum and the second one is human anti tetanus globulin these two are the anti tetanus toxins that we have to remember now anti tetanus serum is actually not very uh, common these days because it has a lot of uh, anaphylactic reactions and all and see how much you have to give you have to give it in large amounts 50000 units almost okay so then later they invented atg atg which is human anti tetanus globulin which is actually very much better and safer as compared to ats because there is less uh, anaphylactic reactions and you just have to give them in small amounts because they are much effective right they are more effective so just give 3000 to 4000 units now coming to the antibiotics antibiotics you have to give injection penicillin and metronidazole the two very common antibiotics that we all know injection penicillin is given as 10 lakh units as qid that means every 6th hourly and metronidazole is given as 500 mg iv tid that means every 8th hourly and in the case of tetanus actually metronidazole is more effective than penicillin now after recovery you have to give a full immunization with tt or tetanus toxoid now let's come to the specific management now specific management the first category is mild cases mild cases means there's only tonic rigidity there are no other complications okay so you can just give them benzodiazepines and morphine to just sedate the patient so that we avoid any further complications or further stimuli and uh, spasms and then we can give chlorpromazine that's it very minimal drugs and you just have to sedate the patient and keep him calm but you should always have an injection diazepam and tracheostomy set and your resuscitation kit ready just keep them ready so that if any emergency arises we can use them so this is the mild case management 
Now, suppose a patient is a seriously ill patient. That means he has also developed the symptoms of dysphagia and reflex spasm. So, since he has developed dysphagia, which means he cannot take anything orally, he cannot have his food, he cannot take his medicines, so we have to give him nasogastric tube. And we might also have to do a tracheostomy if needed, only if needed. But coming to the dangerously ill case, the patient has almost developed major cyanotic convulsions. So we have to give muscle relaxants. We have to give him even ventilatory support. Okay. So since the patient is almost in a bedridden state, we have to take care of his nutrition, his urinary bladder, bowel, frequent change of position to avoid bed sores. Okay. So with that, we have just come to an end of the management. Now, suppose if you don't remember anything about the management, please try to remember this mnemonic sad rat. Okay, sad rat. S is for sedation. Okay, so you can remember uh, that uh, you have to admit and isolate the patient and you have to give him some sedatives. So you can remember, you can recollect some drug names also. Then A is for antitoxin. So antitoxin, what are the two antitoxins I told you? One is anti-tetanus serum and the other one is human anti-tetanus globulin. Anti-tetanus globulin is a better one. Then debridement, wound debridement is important. Then you can give muscle relaxants, antibiotics. The two antibiotics that we studied was uh, penicillin, injection penicillin and metronidazole. And then tracheostomy if needed. So if you have even completely forgotten the management, if you remember this mnemonic sad rat, at least a few headings will come to your mind and you can then recollect the points. So please remember this. Okay. Now since we have understood how dangerous and how deadly this disease is, we will now be appreciating how important it is to give a proper profile axis. Okay. So profile axis is given in three stages or we can study that under three stages. The first one is immunization of mother. Okay, imagine a lady, she's pregnant. Okay, so you have to give her two TT injections, two tetanus toxoid injections, half ml as intramuscular in her third trimester. Okay, two TT injections in her third trimester. Now say she has delivered a baby. And now to that baby also we have to give a vaccine. So that is the second category. In infants and children, what do we give? We give DPT vaccine. I'm sure everybody knows the DPT vaccine, right? It is diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus. And it is called as a triple antigen. Okay, a triple antigen. And it is given in three doses. The first one is given at the sixth week. The second one is given as the tenth week. And the third one is given at the 14th week. So you can remember that. It's all at an interval of 4-4 four, four weeks. Okay. 6. Then after 4 weeks, 10. Then after 4 weeks, 14 weeks. Okay. So 3 doses you're given. And then after 14, if you again add a 4, it is 18. Right. But it's not 18 weeks, but it is 18 months. So at 18th month, you can give the child a booster dose. And then this the child has now all grown up and he's ready to go to school. So when he's about to go to school, that school going age, that is around five years, you have to give him the next dose. So this is the dosage in children. It is DPT vaccine, triple antigen, given as 6, 10 and 14th week. Okay, all at an interval of 4-4. Four, four. And again, the next one is also after an interval of 4, but not 4 weeks, but it is in the months. Okay, 18 months and then at 5 years. Now coming to adults. Now imagine the child has all grown up, so now he is an adult. So in adults, how do we give? Only if they have a provocative injury and if the patient has not taken a booster dose in the previous five years, then you have to give him an injection. Now what are the causes of death in tetanus? It is aspiration and laryngeal spasm and respiratory arrest. Okay. So with that, I hope I have covered all the important headings under the topic. Now let's just quickly brush up through what we have studied. So you try to recollect the points, okay? First, we gave a small introduction about how deadly it is with high rate of morbidity, mortality and all. We discussed the causative organism, that is Clostridium tetany. We discussed the roots of infection. We discussed the main two toxins, that is uh, tetanospasmin and tetanolysin. We discussed what is latent period. Then there were some eight types of tetanus. 
then there were clinical features with the special postures and all that and then we had treatment and prophylaxis and for treatment i told you to remember the mnemonic sad rat if you forget uh, some headings if you remember that mnemonic i'm sure you can recollect a few points okay now this is uh, the previous year question that has been asked what is tetanus and how do you manage it how do you diagnose this and add a note on tetanus prophylaxis so prophylaxis is very important so that's it friends uh, i have taken my reference from manipal manual of surgery for dental students and from srv surgery for dental students now please get back to your textbooks and have a good read now if you found our video informative and helpful please do not forget to like share comment and subscribe to our channel and also click the bell icon so that you get notified every time we upload a new video thank you